Have you ever heard somebody say something to the effect of, well, I stumbled into sin? Perhaps you've said it yourself. Maybe I've said it myself. I don't buy the notion <clears throat> that we stumble into sin. I think that we make a choice. I think we weigh some perceived short-term benefits and ignore the long-term consequences, and we just decide to please ourselves. You know, God's Word's very clear. He says the wages of sin is death. Now, so we're being tempted. Do we think, ah, the wages of sin is death. If I do that, I will die. That sounds like a great idea. I'll do it. No, <laughs> that's not the way it works. I think what we do instead is we look at the short-term pleasure of sin. Why do we sin? Short-term pleasure. I know you might have been told that sin really isn't fun. Well, I think sin really is fun because if it weren't, I don't think we would do it, especially in light of the consequences of sin is death. So we trade off the short-term fun and we kind of ignore the long-term consequences. For example, um, kids are playing out in the street having a good time. Parents come along and say, children, get off the street, you can't play in the street. Is it because the parents don't want the kids to have fun? No, it's because the parents have some wisdom and knowledge and care about the children's safety. Well, you know, God has some rules about our conduct down here on this earth, and I don't think it's because he doesn't want us to have fun. I think it's he sets those rules up because, well, he knows some things that are good for us and he knows that we don't know and maybe as a father in heaven he does very much like a father or a mother here on earth would do to protect their children. Well, if that is the case, we're still vexed with the question, why do we sin? Well, let's think about it for a minute. Consider for a moment uh, a teenager who is being tempted to take their first cigarette. Now, I don't think that they're contemplating the long-term health impact of cigarette smoking. I think that there are many other factors, peer pressure. Uh, what about the person who is about to take their first drink of beverage alcohol? Do you think they're contemplating the long-term health effects of alcohol abuse? Probably not. Oh, you know, no, what they're thinking about is maybe that Miller High Life commercial where all the men are sitting around the campfire and just, you know, having a good time sharing stories with one another. And they say, this is as good as it gets. Well, in a way, Miller, you're right. That is as good as it gets. What they don't show you is the long term abuser of alcohol passed out, laying face down in a puddle of his own vomit. You know, not long ago I uh, did a video about duck hunting and since that time I've been giving some thought uh, to some of the things discussed in that video and I'd like to share them with you now because I think they would shed some light on the subject matter. Why do we sin? You know, ducks have a built-in, it's in their DNA, it's genetic, uh, they're very weary. Uh, before they light on the water, they circle up high and they look at a, at a potential place to land. Well, the duck hunter is rather cunning. The duck hunter will put out decoys. That's fake ducks. They, they float around. And the ducks, see, they're, they're looking down there saying, gosh, everybody else is doing it. Must be okay for me to do it too. But then the skilled duck hunter pulls out their duck call and starts to make the sounds of a duck. And the ducks hear that sound and say, oh man, that's music. Let's go down and join the fun. Well, they descend down to their peril and to their death. As they come in range, they are picked off by the hunter's shotgun and later put in the oven to become a meal. You know, duck hunters have another way of uh, gaining an advantage over a duck. It's actually, it works so well it's illegal. They pour corn into the water. Now, does the duck hunter do that because they care about the health and well-being of the duck to make sure that they're well fed? No. But the ducks find the corn and they attract and they come in there every day after day after day. They eat until they're full and it's just great. But then one day when they fly in, the duck hunter is in the blind, hidden from their view. And as they approach, the shotgun goes off and the ducks are killed 
and later eaten. Think about a, a fisherman and the tackle box. In that tackle box, no doubt, you will find hooks. So does the fisherman attach a hook to the end of the line, dangle it in the water, and say, fishy, fishy, come get on my hook so I can snag you, but get you in the boat, fillet you out, throw you in some hot grease, and eat you? Well, of course not. No, the hooks are cleverly hidden in the bait. Let that sink in. The hooks are cleverly hidden in the bait. It might be an artificial worm, the natural food of a fish, or it could be a topwater lure that moves and makes sounds and attracts the fish and say, man, that looks really good. Man, I like the way that lure is wiggling around and catch that. And they strike the lure and suddenly have a mouthful of hooks and are in the boat and they are soon in the frying pan. God's word is very clear. The wages of sin is death. God's word is very clear that we have a deceiver out there who will assist us in deceiving ourselves. And the Bible goes on to say he is the most cunning. Folks, we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Thankfully, God sent Jesus Christ to be our Redeemer. And through His death on the cross, our sins are forgiven for those who accept Him as Lord and Savior. And our eternal destiny in heaven is secure. But in the meantime, we live here on the earth. While we're living here on the earth, let's remember the hooks are hidden in the bait.